begin and finish uh, the uh, discussion in the non-compact case. So far, we have been interested by uh, compact Riemann surfaces, which coincide with algebraic surfaces, algebraic curves. And, uh, of course, it is interesting to look at non-compact things. And this is also a very long story. And I wanted to begin by uh, giving an outline of some other historical, uh, very important uh, development, which is the classification of surfaces. Let's see, topological classification of surfaces. So I just want to give a, an outline of how the process developed and how uh, one finally uh, got the fact that all we all know that a compact surface which is orientable is a homeomorphic to a torus with a G handles. We know that. But how was the process uh, to, get the, to, to go to this statement? It took a long time. So let me give the main steps. First, we have seen that Riemann knew but did not prove that the surface of genus G, implicitly orientable and compact, is homeomorphic to that which G holds. He knew that, he did not prove it. But first of all, I have to say that for Riemann, the concept of an abstract surface was not clear at all. The concept that we all have of uh, a topological space covered with charts and change of coordinates was not at all clear in his mind. In the case of Riemann, for Riemann, it was something very complicated. The picture was something in free space, and it was a surface which was uh, loaded to intersect itself along some lines. And the status of these lines were, was not clear at all. There was lines where the surface was intersecting itself, but somehow the points on this line were doubled. It was not clear at all. But in any way, I just want to tell you that Riemann was not able to think of a surface as being abstract by itself. It was something which had to be embedded in free space. Then uh, the first proofs or attempt to get, to get classification, the topological classification, began around 18, 1860 or something. So the first name is uh, uh, Möbius. who indeed gave a proof. And uh, uh, he gave a proof which I think is a um, solid proof, but he was making some uh, assumptions. He was looking at embedded surfaces, compact surfaces in free space. So implicitly, we know today that such a surface is orientable. And Möbius classified, I mean, proved the theorem of Riemann in this context. And the proof of Möbius is just remarkable. The proof of Möbius is Morse theory. which, of course, Morse is much later. If you look in the paper, at the paper of Möbius, it's just remarkable. You have a surface in three space. He puts the surface in general position with respect to horizontal planes, 
and it just looks at the section by horizontal planes and seeing how it behaves it, with a very good discussion at what's happening close to the critical points. And the proof that is given by Möbius is totally modern. It's just a standard proof from today's textbook using Morse theory. So this is a, a great proof. The problem is that this proof is embedded. I mean, the discussion is only inside three space. You have a surface in three space, and you want to classify its topology. Then uh, uh, people wanted to understand the more general situation, and the next names are Jordan. Jordan in 1866. In 1866, is still looking at smooth surfaces. Compact, orientable, but of course all these names are not, uh, all these words are not in this discussion. They are implicit assumptions. And these surfaces with, that Chordon is looking at are now immersed in free space. So, it is allowing double lines, I mean self-intersections. This is made explicit by Jordan. This is a great progress when you compare with uh, Möbius. And the idea of the proof is very different. He's not using more theory anymore. He is doing the other standard proof that we find in contemporary textbooks. He is using triangulation. So what Jordan does is just he decomposes the surface in triangles and he looks at the way these triangles are glued together and he reduces that to a combinatorial study of polygons and how you glue them and how you glue the boundaries and you know the proof that we have today is exactly the proof given by Jordan. And again because of the, the way people were thinking at the time the proof is not abstract is a proof always inside free space. Neither Riemann nor Möbius nor Jordan were able to imagine a surface by itself. It was inside space. But it was quite convincing. And then came, you know, the analysis situs of Poincaré, all these papers of Poincaré. And then, uh, People understood that there should be a proof independently of an embedding or independently of an immersion in free space. And uh, uh, the first paper for that is Dane and Higgard in 1907. Dane and Higgard, 1907. They give a, they look at PL, piecewise linear surfaces, which are now abstract surfaces. In other words, they take many triangles and they glue them along their sides abstractly, independently of any embedding in free space. This is a major progress. They are thinking abstractly, combinatorically, gluing triangles together. And then they make some, uh, you know, this uh, elementary uh, change of gluings and they reduce to standard form. So this, and they have the same theorem. Surfaces, orientable, compact, are classified by the genus. Now let us discuss uh, uh, first uh, uh, when these people, Dane and Hegel, published their paper, there was a comment by Felix Klein. 
Felix Klein, Klein write, wrote a report on this, a very negative report. Felix Klein claimed that this paper was a typical example of a paper that he hated. Because he said that it's understandable only if you already know the theorem. It's just like completely abstract and no uh, contact with reality. And there was a strong uh, um, uh, comment that mathematics should not be written this way. And Klein at the time was really powerful. So, you know, receiving a bad comment from, from Klein in 1907 was uh, something strong. And then, let me say a few words about the non-orientable case. The Möbius band, that we call Möbius, has not been invented by Möbius. It was invented or discovered by Listing. Listing was a student of Riemann, and Listing is well known for one uh, important uh, discovery. He created the word topology. And he wrote the first book on topology with this title, Topology, in 1862. And in this book, he uh, introduced this Möbius band. And then people became aware that there was this problem of non-orientability, but it took a long time. Riemann was not aware of that because, of course, he was looking at Riemann surfaces that are orientable more or less by definition. And uh, Möbius was not taking care of that because he was looking at embedded surfaces in free space, which are automatically orientable. And Jordan was aware of uh, this difficulty uh, and then he mentioned this uh, orientability question. And uh, then uh, the Klein bottle, again, is not due to Klein. The Klein bottle has been invented by Kelly. Uh, it's called Klein bottle because Klein mentions Klein bottle in, in one of these books, but it was uh, cle clearly um, uh, invented by Kelly. And if you look at the, uh, this non-orient... Kelly. Kelly? Kelly? You should say the Kelly bottle. And if you go to this non-orientability question, you see, uh, 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 by listing time, in the time of listing, this Möbius band was something very strange. And uh, uh, 20 years later, when you look at the papers of Poincaré, Poincaré, of course, is aware of the existence of the Möbius band. And what is the terminology that Poincaré is, how, what is the terminology which is used by Poincaré? Poincaré does not say the Möbius band. He says the unilateral surface that everybody knows. So in, in the end of the 19th century, this Möbius band was really accepted and understood. Okay, so that's for the uh, topological, the, the, everything up to then was smooth or combinatorical. And then came the question, what about the topological classification of surfaces? You take a surface which is locally homeomorphic to the plane, how can you classify it? Then the classification became, be, began much later. Because you had standard questions in topology in the plane. And mainly, two theorems were needed. One is what we call the Jordan curve theorem. Well, you know the theorem that if you take an embedding of the circle in the plane, which is continuous, then the complement has two, con two connected components.
Well, this theorem has a long story too. It is uh, unfair to call it Jordan. Uh, Jordan stated it in 1887. and claimed he had a proof. And the proof by Jordan was very not convincing. First, Jordan claimed that the proof was obvious when the embedding is smooth. Obvious. No explanation. And then his work was to prove that this statement about the smooth case implies the statement in the continuous case. And this was kind of convincing. But there's not, not a single word about this thing. Then there was many criticisms. Uh, a lot of people complained. And if, even in the case where the curve is a polygon, So you just take a polygon, polygonal curve in the plane, prove that the complement has two connected components. Even that is not obvious at all and was proved by Schoenflis in 1896 for the polygonal case. polygonal case. And then it seems, according to, the, to Siebenman, that the first convincing proof of the Jordan curve theorem is due to Veblen in 1905. So what Veblen did is that he used this idea of, Schoen, of Schoenfries for the polygon, polygonal case, he generalized it to the smooth case, and then he used the idea of Jordan to make it true for any continuous curve. So you say it should be called the Veblen theorem. Okay, so this is one of the main theorems in the topology of the plane. The second important theorem is the Schoenfries theorem. But you will see that the Schoenfries theorem is not due to Schoenfries, just like Jordan's theorem is not due to Jordan. Schoenfries theorem is this. This is the following. If you take an embedding, a continuous embedding of the circle in the plane, then there is a homeomorphism such that the composition maps the circle to the round disk, to the round circle to the unit circle. So you are given a complicated topological curve. So by Jordan, we know that there are two connected components. And the theorem of Schoenfries says there's a global homeomorphism of the plane that maps this picture to the round circle. As you know, this is much harder than the proof of Jordan because uh, one of the reasons is that this is not true in higher dimensions. This is a theorem which is true in dimension two and which is not true in higher dimension. If you take a sphere in three space, it is not, it is not always homeomorphic to a round ball, a round sphere. This is also a very complicated story. Um, let me say a few words about that. Um, Actually, uh, according to Siebenman, uh, for the smooth case, if this curve is smooth,
it seems, according to Siebenman again, that who proved it was Jordan? That is, you look in the original proof of Jordan. I told, I told you the original proof of Jordan, of Jordan theorem was wrong because he was assuming that the theorem was true for smooth case. But it seems that, according to, to Siebenman, that Jordan's proof gives, with a few more lines, Schoenflis in the smooth category. But anyway, Jordan does not state it. It's just that's a looking today at the proof of Jordan, we find important steps in Jordan of the state of the proof of the, of the theorem of, of Schoenfries, but Jordan did not state it. Did not state it. And then it took a long, long time, and basically, uh, uh, who proved it was Osgood in 1900. So, proof. A complete proof of Schoenfli's theorem is due to Osgood in 19. And this proof uses conformal map. But the proof is still very complicated. The problem is that nobody believed in the proof of Osgood. Uh, it is not well written, I can tell you. And uh, uh, many people complained, and uh, uh, there's a long list of papers trying to fix the proof of Osgood, but the proof of Osgood was correct. And uh, what happened is that um, in 1906, Schoenfries claimed that he had a proof of Schoenfries' theorem, which was true, but Osgood had a proof of Schoenfries' theorem, but it's not fair to call it Schoenfries. And the terminology uh, of uh, Schoenfries' theorem uh, comes from um, um, uh, pum, pum, pum much later, 1940 or something, I forgot. No, 1949, Wilder. 1949, Wilder called it the statement Schoenfried theorem. So you see, it's a long story. It's very complicated, not so, so clear, etc. Okay, so these are the two main tools for uh, uh, two di uh, two-dimensional uh, topology. And now what about the classification of surfaces, of topological surfaces? classification of topological surfaces. So here we make no smoothness assumption, and you want to understand that. That was also rather complicated. Uh, 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 to make things short, one should say that uh, the critical step has been done by Radu in 1925, where Radu proved that surface topological surfaces are triangulable. Triangulable. So you could reduce the classification classification theory to the previous classification 
in the combinatorial case. That's a hard theorem it's still today. It's, not, it's, not, it's far from being obvious. And uh, uh, let me finish this uh, just general historical description by describing what's known about the non-compact surfaces. That's also rather long story. So the key name for this is um, uh, Freudenthal, Kerek Jarto, and Schönfries. Freudenthal. Kerek Jarto and Schönfries. They created the notion of ends of non-compact spaces, locally compact spaces, and they used it to give a complete classification. I will not describe that many of you know, but this is not fundamental. Again, this classification of non-compact surfaces has been criticized because it was totally uh, uh, incomplete. And uh, finally, uh, it was made uh, uh, complete and acceptable in 1963 by somebody called Richards. And even like that, it was not accepted fully. And the last paper I know about that is Goldman in 1971. 1971. Goldman wrote a paper in which he claims that this is the final paper on the subject. Okay? So you see, it's a very long story from, from, from Riemann, 1846, to Goldman, 1971. The process was long, complicated, with wrong proofs to do it again and start with new assumptions, etc., etc. So I think it's, it's important to have that in mind. Now, the progress of mathematics is not completely analytic. Eh? Okay. Now, let me go to a quick description of the uniformization theorem in the non-compact case. Because so far, I discussed a lot, maybe too much, the case of compact algebraic curves. And as I told you at the beginning, the theorem is really this one. Any theorem, so Poincaré, Kirby, 1907, any simply connected Riemann surface is isomorphic to the Riemann sphere or to the unit disk or to the plane. This is the elliptic case, this is the hyperbolic case, parabolic case. Now let me make a, a few comments about the way Poincaré and Kirby were, enunci were stating the theorem. Well, so far, actually, I just observed that I still did not define what Riemann surface is. I just want to mention that the definition of Riemann surface that we have today as being a two-dimensional manifold equipped with charts, coordinates in C, and change of coordinates are holomorphic functions from an open set in C to an open set of C. This definition is modern definition. 
This definition, the traditional definition, is due to Hermann Weil, 1918. So after the proof of uh, Poincaré Kirby theorem. So what what was what was the definition that Poincaré and even Riemann, Schwartz, Klein, all these people, what was the definition that they had in mind? Well, for them, for the founders, uh, for the founders of the theory, the Riemann surface was more than what, we, what it is today. It was a Riemann surface as we have today, plus some meromorphic function. So let me, let me explain that. When uh, Riemann defines the concept of Riemann surface, he is not interested at all by any kind of abstract object. I told you, he's trying to draw pictures in R3. For him, he's basically interested by algebraic curves. So take a polynomial in two variables and look at the curve P of x, y is equal to zero. This is a curve in the plane. And what Riemann is doing is that he's thinking of this object, let's say in projective plane CP2, He's thinking of this object as being lying above C by sending the point X, Y to the point X. So the Riemann surface X, it's a capital X, that Riemann is looking at, by definition, is sitting above the complex plane C. And given a point little x on X on C, you have several points above it. So in a modern way, we say that by definition, for Riemann, Riemann surface is one of our Riemann surfaces plus this map going from the surface to C. And this map is a meromorphic function. Never, never, Riemann will discuss a Riemann surface with nothing to start with. Riemann is always looking at surfaces above the plane. Now, what, when Poincaré and Kirby are, are, are discussing the case of non-simply connect, or, or, of non-compact surfaces, this is exactly the same situation. So they are looking this. Riemann, uh, Riemann is thinking of Riemann surface as being a, some function y of x, where you think of this as being a multi-valued function. For every x, you have several values of x, of, your, of y. Well, what, what Poincaré and all these people do is that they look at a germ of a holomorphic function, So y is phi of x, where x lies in some neighborhood of 0. So it's a local germ of a holomorphic function defined in neighborhood of 0. And what all these people do is they try to extend this germ of holomorphic function as far as they can. So they take a path, and they take analytic continuation. And of course, they know very well that if you take a path, and if you take another path, you may find different results. So what they do in this case is they construct a Riemann surface, which is defined this way. You take all paths 
starting from the origin, containing little balls, and you take analytic continuations, and you uh, develop in this way a Riemann surface, which tells you about the germ of function phi. And this Riemann surface X that you construct, by construction, is mapped onto C by the variable X. So what I mean is that Poincaré, Kirby, at this time, were only interested in Riemann surfaces equipped with a neuromorphic function to C. That was part of their definition. It took a long time, essentially the work of Hermann Weil, to discover that the, this neuromorphic function was not important in the theory of, of Riemann surfaces and that actually one could prove that any Riemann surface admits some neuromorphic function. And Hermann Weil noticed that not only it is true that any Riemann surface has a neuromorphic function, but he discovered that Riemann proved it without noticing it. Okay, so let me explain. Uh, I wanted to explain that. You will see why it, is, uh, it, it will be somehow important in the proof. Uh, even though I will not give the, proof, the full proof of that today because it's complicated. Huh? Okay, now... Before I go to that, let me say a few words about a theorem of Osgood. It is uh, the theorem that many people call Riemann. Uh, simply any simply connected open set in C is biholomorphic to the unit disk. Uh, let's say uh, any simply uh, non-trivial okay so this is the theorem that we all call Riemann theorem I think I explained to you that this was stated by Riemann uh, in his thesis under the condition that the domain the open set is bounded by a smooth curve I told you that the proof of Riemann using minimization of energy was wrong. I told you that since uh, the proof of uh, Riemann was not convincing, Schwartz was uh, puzzled by that. And he said, uh, if this is true, it must, be, it must be true in the most simple examples, like, for example, a triangle or a polygon. I told you that Schwartz indeed proved it in the case of a triangle, and he gave an explicit formula for it. Schwartz could not do it directly for polygons with more than three sides. He could find the general formula, but he could not prove the existence of a conformal map for a polygon with more than three sides. So he was limited to triangles. And then Schwartz invented what I described in the previous talk, uh, the alternating method of Schwartz to prove that if the theorem is true for two domains, and if the intersection of the two domains is simply connected, 
then the theorem is true for the union of the two domains. So if you can do it for a triangle, if you can do it for another triangle, then you can do it for the union of the two triangles. By some, but the proof was a, uh, by a limiting procedure, very different in spirit from the proof for a triangle. So using that, the result was that for polygons, it was okay. But for more complicated domains, it was still open. Even in the case of Riemann, where the boundary was smooth curve. So what Osgood did, again in 1900, well, you take some open, simply connected domain, But uh, Osgood knew very well that the boundary might be something more complicated than a curve. For example, it could be something like that, or even worse. So Osgood knew that very well. And he's basically interested by the case where the boundary is not a smooth curve. So what Os Osgood does is that he proves that omega is an increasing union of polygonal domains. Each pi is a polygon, and each pi is contained in the bigger one. Well, that's not so hard, finally. You just exhaust your domain by bigger, by increasing sequence of polygons. I should say simply connected polygons. Huh? And then Osgoods calls Schwartz and uses Schwartz method mixing triangles and alternating method to get conformal representation from the disk to these polygons. So you get a sequence of holomorphic mappings, phi i, from the unit disk to PI. Well, I should have said you can always assume omega is bounded. Assume omega is sitting inside the unit disk. That's not. Uh, uh, and then you see, well, for us, it's obvious what to do. But at the time, it was not obvious at, at all. Well, the thing is, take the limit. <coughs> so why does there exist a limit? Well, for us, it is very easy to look to, to, to do that because, you know, we have holomorphic maps from a disk to a disk. So by Schwartz lemma, we know that such a map is contracting hyperbolic distance. And therefore, this is an equicontinuous family. And therefore, by Ascoli theorem, there is a subsequent which is converging. And by uh, Weierstrass theorem, a limit of holomorphic functions is holomorphic, and uh, at the limit you get a holomorphic function. So uh, this is a sketch of uh, what we call today a Montel type argument, Montel, com Montel compactness. But of course, at the time, Montel was not available. 
Uh, it turns out that the uh, uh, first paper of Montel about that is 1907, just six months after the statement of Poincaré and Kirby. However, uh, if you, uh, I will not go into the details of the proof of Ross Good, which is really, very, really clever. This is really a proof which is not using, strictly speaking, the compactness method of Montel, but if you read between the lines, you really find some compactness argument. So uh, I, I will not explain it, but I just want to say that probably uh, Montel was motivated by this kind of, of, of arguments of uh, compactness. But really what, what, uh, what Osgood is doing is that he's um, proving that this sequence of maps converges, and actually he's not working with the sequence of maps, he's working with the log of their modulus as harmonic functions, and he's more able to work with harmonic functions. He knows the Harnack principle he knows the compactness, even though he's not using the word. He knows the compactness of harmonic, of positive harmonic functions. So he, he knows quite, quite a lot. So if you look at the proof of, of Osgood, well, when we read it, maybe in the book we made some comments about the proof. When we read it, it's hard for us not to, uh, not to use this compactness, but you know, uh, 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 functional analysis, compactness arguments in infinite dimension, all of this is 19th, 19th, 20th century, uh, after 20, 1920 at least. So for, for us, it's difficult to read Osgood without uh, having in mind this compactness argument. Anyway, so this is the proof of, uh, of Osgood. So finally, you see, it took more than 50 years between the statement of this theorem by Riemann and the proof by Osgood. In the case where the domain is bounded by a smooth curve, the proof of Riemann, I told you, minimiz minimization of energy was not correct, but the statement was correct. There is a map which does minim minimize the energy, and the existence of this minimum has been proved also by in, in 1900, but this time by Hilbert, where Hilbert fixed the proof of Riemann. He did prove that there is a minimum for the energy, and again, I mean, I think it's a wonderful example where you see development of mathematics, Hilbert in this paper creates the notion of Hilbert space for this purpose. So the Hilbert space has been invented here because he wants to find the natural space in which you can minimize a quadratic functional like the energy. So really Hilbert space theory has been created there and proving Riemann theorem only when the boundary is smooth. If you look for complicated domains with non-smooth boundaries, you need Montel-type argument. Okay, now, let's go to the proof of the general uniformization theorem by Kirby and Poincaré. to the general theorem so you have a simply connected simply connected Riemann surface 
and you want to prove that this Riemann surface is the sphere, the disk, or the plane. Well, uh, the two proofs uh, in 1907 were really published uh, independently. The paper of, of Poincaré was maybe three months earlier. But the two proofs are very different. Very different. But what is interesting is that uh, since I think I spoke too much of Poincaré, I want to present uh, Kirby for once. You see, this is basically a Franco-German story, yeah? with the exception of Osgood, who was American. Uh, and it is interesting to note that the British, for example, have no contribution at all in this uh, uh, piece of mathematics. Uh, at the time, you know, algebraic geometry in, in, in England uh, was something very developed, but they were looking at invariant theory, uh, polynomial rings, uh, many interesting things, but no hint of any kind of transcendental methods in, in algebraic geometry at the time. So this is really a French-German theory with the exception of Osgood. Kirby was much younger than Poincaré. He was so happy to prove this theorem and uh, he, he published hundreds, yes, hundreds of papers on the subject uh, starting 19, 1907 to, I don't I forgot, but he published a lot about that. So let me go to the point of view of, of Kirby. And let me forget about Poincaré for today. Okay, so Kirby is working in the following way. One, he's using the topological classification of surfaces or well, let's say smooth to show that the Riemann surface that we are looking at, X, is an increasing union of polygonal domains. That's not so hard. And if you believe that your surface is triangulable, uh, you, you just take a triangulation of the surface and you just take all triangles, the first, second, third, etc., etc., you get a subsurface with boundary, you fill the holes, and you get a polygonal domain. But you need some, top, you need some topological uh, uh, description. Uh, it is interesting to note that for Kirby, this is kind of obvious. He makes a comment, uh, uh, where is it? Kirby uh, says, um, okay. I will not give you the sentence in, in German, but he says that the construction of such a sequence of domains does not present any kind of difficulty. And this is all what he says about it. Okay, so probably he had a proof, but he did not think it was the main point. Now, the problem is that unlike the case of Osgood, where these polygons were polygons in the plane. So where you could use uh, uh, Schwartz method, these polygons are polygons, smooth polygons in some abstract surface. How can you use Schwartz method if you have a polygonal domain whose sides are not straight lines? I mean, it doesn't make anything to be a straight line. 
because we are in some abstract human surface. The good point is that in the case I told you, in the case of Kirby, the Riemann surface is not abstract. The Riemann surface is equipped with a meromorphic function to the plane. So if you take uh, in your Riemann surface a triangle here, If you project it to the plane, it might be ugly. It might be non-one-to-one. -one. It might be non-limited by segments. But anyway, what you can do is you can subdivide in small triangles or polygons such that their projections are triangles Uh, real triangles, I mean triangles in the plane which are limited by segments in the plane. You just modify your triangulation upstairs to make it such that after this refinement these little triangles upstairs project down to triangles in the plane, triangles limited by segments. And so each of these triangles that you have upstairs are holomorphically equivalent to a triangle in the plane. And for a triangle in the plane, you can use, you can use the, Schwartz print, the Schwartz method. So you have this work to, be, to, to do to transform this kind of abstract triangulation that you have on this abstract surface to, to, to make it such that after this perturbation, the new triangulation is such that each triangle is actually biholomorphic to a triangle downstairs. And then you have to adapt Schwartz method alternating method to show that if you know how to map conformally a triangle to the disk, if you know how to map conformally two domains to the disk, if the intersection is simply connected, then you can also, by some limiting procedure, alternating procedure, you can also map the union of the two to a disk. So this is a lot of work to do. It's not terribly complicated, but it has to be done. And in this way, you can show that indeed each PI is biholomorphic to the disk. So this is a mixture of topology. We have to deal with triangulations, change them a little bit, and, uh, uh, and uh, adaptation of Schwartz alternating method, where you use uh, partial conformal maps, take the limit, alternating transformation, and take to the limit. And then you want to do something that, like Osgood did. You have this family of increasing domains, polygonal domains in the Riemann surface. Each one of them is biholomorphic to the disk, and you wish to have a limit. Well, this is the point, this is the place where Kirby proves what we call today the one fourth, one fourth. Kirby theorem. So I remind you, you take a injective holomorphic map from the disk to C, phi, phi is injective, holomorphic, you assume 
to, you normalize in such a way that phi prime of zero is one. And the theorem of Kirby says that the image of the disk contains at least the disk of center zero and radius one fourth. So this theorem that which is classical today is introduced at this moment. You want to understand the behavior of these injective maps. And um, actually, in the, in the paper of, point of Kirby, he does not prove that. He, he has another version of it which is weaker than that. He does not have the one-fourth. He has some universal constant, but he does not have the one-fourth. But that's enough for him. What? Fixing zero? You're right, phi of zero, uh, phi prime. So uh, what is the procedure of, of Kirby now? Well, you have to extract some converging uh, sequence. So you, uh, you have these maps, phi i. Uh, uh, maybe I should do the other way. So I have p1, psi p2. P1, let me call it Psi 1 to the disk, Psi 2 to the disk, Psi i to the disk. Okay, so you fix a point. You can always assume that this point is mapped to the to zero, so all the Psi i maps the point to zero. And you would like to go to limit. So you have these holomorphic maps defined on P1, then on P2, then on P3, etc., etc. So obviously what we want to do is some, some kind of diagonal argument. You will restrict all these psi i to the first P1. And you wish to have a limiting sequence. So you restrict all these psi i to P1. And if you want to understand the limit, of course, you have to look at derivative at the origin. So you have two cases. The first case is when the, this uh, thing is bounded. And when it's unbounded. What? Increasing, yes, this is increasing. See? This is uh, decreasing or increasing? This is, this is decreasing, so uh, it could be, so, sorry. So it's uh, bounded from below. This is decreasing sequence. Hmm? Or uh, 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 subsequence goes to zero, or, or goes to zero, or the limit is zero. Okay, this is a decreasing sequence by Schwarz lemma. So either the sequence is going to, going to zero, or it's bounded from below. Now, if it's bounded from below. You use some form of Kirby one fourth lemma that essentially I will not go into the details of the proof of Kirby, but what essentially what Kirby does is that he uses this compactness again. Compactness argument 
even though here I am just lying because this argument did not exist at the time, but if you look at the paper, you have this exactly. It says that the space of injective holomorphic maps from a disk to C, to psi, which are send 0 to 0, kind of derivative this one is compact. With the converge, uniform convergence on compact sets. Of course, this this classical theorem is not explicitly mentioned in, uh, in, in Kirby, but this is essentially what he's using. Okay, so if you have a derivative bounded from below, you have a sequence of uh, holomorphic maps from uh, uh, the same disk to C. They are injective. The derivative at the origin is, by definition, bounded from below. So really, this is a compact family. So there is a subsequence of the psi i, which is converging on the first polygon P1. Then you take this subsequence and you go to P2 and you have the same argument. And then you go by some by diagonal argument, which was of course classical at the time. The diagonal argument you find it in in um, contour at least. Well, and then you get a limiting map psi, which will map the full Riemann surface x into the disk injectively. So when the, it's bounded from below, <coughs> if derivatives are bounded from below, you have some limiting map, psi, of some sub subsequence of, the, of that psi i. And this limiting map goes from the full Riemann surface into the disk. And so you have proved that your Riemann surface is isomorphic to some open set in the plane. And then you can use Osgood. So X is biholomorphic to some simply connected to psi of X, which is some open set in the disk. And then Osgood gives X is biholomorphic to the disk. Okay, and when this sequence is going, going to zero, which is the second case, well, you play basically the same game. But you have to rescale psi i, and you divide it by its derivative at the origin. So you define maybe you define phi i as being psi i divided by its derivative at the origin. Yeah. What? Star. 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 At the origin star. <laughs> and now you have a map phi i, which is going from the polygon pi i not to the disk, but in the complex plane, because you are dividing by something going to zero. And now if you restrict this new map phi i to P1, to P1, 
again you have a sequence of holomorphic injective functions having derivative 1 at the origin. So you can again take a limiting subsequence and then you get a subsequence in P2 and a subsequence in P3, etc., etc. And what you get at the end is a limiting map phi which maps X, the Riemann surface, to C, not to the unit disk anymore, but to C. And since the image of psi i is growing, 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 I divide it by something going to zero, the image of phi i will cover the full complex line. So this limit phi is on two, as well as one to one. It's a limit of one to one functions, it's a one to one function, and it's on two because its image will cover larger and larger disks. And so at the end, you did have, you proved that indeed X is biholomorphic to C. So that's the sketch of the proof of uh, Osgood. It's, I'm, I'm lying a little bit because, you know, I used compactness argument twice. This compactness argument was not available to, to Osgood, but uh, he has some kind of weak version of compactness argument, which is enough for him. The paper is long. Huh? It's a long paper. Uh, it's not easy to read. I think the paper of Kirby is much better than the paper of Poincaré on the subject. Poincaré is mixing many things and the proof is, is, uh, is more complicated. Okay, so let me uh, finish by uh, mentioning uh, a difficulty. If you want to prove this without using the a priori existence of a meromorphic function. Because I told you uh, there was a, was a main step, the step number one in the proof of, uh, in, in the step number one <coughs> in the proof of Osgood is to find a good triangulation which is such that under the given meromorphic map, these triangles are mapped to straight triangles. So what do you do with you don't have a uh, meromorphic function to start with? And um, let me mention the difficulty which has been observed later in the 20s. Of course, today we know, we know that a non-compact human surface is a, is a Stein manifold. So you do have many holomorphic, or holomorphic functions on it. But Stein was in the 50s, so, or maybe in the 40s, I don't know. So at the time, nobody knew that. Just one example. If you take an abstract surface, human surface, If you take an abstract Riemann surface, and if you take two points on it, it is not clear a priori, and it's not obvious, that you can connect them by some real analytic arc. If you start with a Riemann surface with 
a meromorphic to the plane, meromorphic uh, function to the plane, it's very easy to lift an analytic uh, function connecting them. But if you do not have this meromorphic function, how do you do? And then uh, 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 there was discussion in the 20s about the following question. So you have your abstract Riemann surface, and suppose you have a triangulation by smooth or even real analytic curves. How do you know, or is it possible, to map this triangle holomorphically to uh, a plane, to, 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 to a planar triangle. Is it possible to do that? Of course, we know by, by we know today that we can map this triangle to that triangle, but how does it behave here? And people uh, ask the following question. You take two curves in the plane, analytic curves, gamma 1 and gamma 2, which are real analytic curves, They intersect at some point transversely, and you ask yourself, is there a local biholomorphism mapping this picture to this picture? Two lines. Can you transform two curves intersecting in one point into lines intersecting in one point? Of course, if you want to do that, the angle Theta between the two curves has to be has to be preserved. So the angle here should also be theta. And the question is, is it possible to do that? And the answer is not always. I will show you that. <coughs> that's not always the case, and that's the main difficulty if you are given a triangulation. Uh, on a Riemann surface, and you want to transform this triangulation to actual triangle, uh, you you need that, and that doesn't work. And that's uh, let me show you why uh, this is not the case. I think it's uh, kind of a, a beautiful. Uh, the first observation is that if you give me a real analytic curve in the plane, by definition of what real analytic is, you can map it to the real axis by some holomorphic map. This is definition of real analytic. Now, if you have the real axis, you have the symmetry. We discussed that already. Z goes to Z bar. And the Schwarz reflection principle tells us that any holomorphic mapping preserving the real axis has to commute with this involution, z goes to z bar, which means that if I pull back this involution by phi, I get some involution here. This is anti-holomorphic involution. So, any real analytic in the plane, a, any real analytic curve in the plane, defines canonically an involution around that curve. This involution is anti-holomorphic. So any curve gives you an involution. Now if you have two curves, you have two involutions. Each one is anti-holomorphic. So you can compose these two involutions. And the compositions, let me call this involution I gamma. If I compose the involution I gamma 1 with the involution I gamma 2, I compose two anti-holomorphic maps, I get a holomorphic map. And this holomorphic map is fixing the point 0.
And if I compute the derivative of this map at zero, I'm just taking the composition of two symmetries with respect to two lines. So at zero, the derivative is just exponential of 2i pi, maybe 4i pi theta. Because when you compose two symmetries with respect to two lines, you get a rotation whose angle is twice the angle between the, the lines. Anyway, so that means that such a picture here canonically defines a germ of a holomorphic diffeomorphism of C preserving the origin. If I change by conjugacy, the germ changes by conjugacy. So if I want to send this picture to this one, this germ should be conjugate to the germ associated to this one. And the germ associated to two lines is just a rotation. This one. And then we hit against the famous problem in dynamics. We want to know if a germ of a holomorphic map fixing zero, having derivative of modulus one at the origin, is conjugate holomorphically or not to rotation. And then we know very well the, the solution. Today, we know that if theta is not, if theta is rational, then the answer is typically no. Such a germ is not conjugate to a rotation. You have these uh, uh, petals and all this uh, Fatou and uh, Julia uh, parabolic sectors, etc., etc. So the answer, the answer is no. If theta is irrational, Well, it depends on Diophantine conditions. If, Diophantine, if, if the angle theta is Diophantine, the answer is yes. If not, the answer is sometimes no. But this we know by uh, Siegel and uh, uh, Yokos and all these people. So we know that uh, and, uh, uh, much more recently. All these people did not know that. So the consequence is that if you want to prove the uniformization theorem without using a priori existence of a meromorphic function, you cannot take any triangulation and, and push it to the, to the plane and say, OK, it's, it's, I can use Schwartz's method. You cannot. Because of this difficulty, you cannot uh, play the game. So the game is, is a little bit more subtle. You have to modify your triangulation. And you have to modify it in such a way that after the modification, the angles are diophantine. And you can do that. And after that, you can, uh, uh, this we did in the book, we can uh, uh, fix or we can propose a proof of uniformization in the spirit of what's good without using meromorphic function a priori. And I think that's, uh, that's, uh, that's, that's the, uh, that's good proof, actually. Okay, so maybe I take two minutes to say, uh, 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 to say, uh, what I should have explained and what I did not have time to do. My first, um, uh, the first, the most important thing I did not explain, and I'm very sorry about that was that I wanted to discuss <coughs> the uh, actual motivation of Poincaré for uniformization, which was differential equations. <coughs> I told you Poincaré was interested by solutions of linear algebraic differential equations. And the uniformization appeared as a tool 
to uh, uh, explicitly write down formulas for explicitly giving the solutions of, of, uh, of, a, linear, of a linear differential equation. Uh, unfortunately, um, I had no time to explain that. And the um, second thing I should, I should have explained but I had no time is the link with number theory. I mean, many, uh, that was the motivation for, uh, for Felix Klein. Felix Klein was not interested in, uh, um, Felix Klein was not interested at all in differential equations, or not too much. He was basically interested by number theory, and, and uh, a typical example of things that he had in mind was taking, uh, let's say, the group PSL to Z, reduce it modulo n, take the kernel of this, and this gives you a discrete subgroup of PSL to R, and take the quotient of the Poincaré disk by this subgroup. You get a Riemann surface, which typically is not compact, because you miss some cusps, you compactify it, and you get a compact Riemann surface. And the main motivation for, for Klein was to try to understand what kind of Riemann surface it is, and for example, to find some equation for it. Find an equation. As an algebraic curve. depending on n. That's the modular equation. And uh, uh, I wish I could have explained that better. I, I, I did not explain it at all, actually. But that was the uh, motivation for, for Klein. So it's, I think it's interesting to see that Klein was, had motivation coming from number theory. Poincaré had motivation coming from differential equations. And both of them could collaborate to uh, produced this wonderful theorem of uh, uniformization. Okay, thank you very much for your attention. <clears throat>